Good morning, and welcome to worship as we gather in this final Sunday of the 2015 uh, Old Year's New Year's service for us as we reflect back on God's faithfulness this past year and look ahead towards what He will do in the coming year. So we prepare to do that this service. We also look forward to a baptism of Derek and Amy Lorenz's uh, baby, and we look forward to that. We want to welcome you if you're a family member here, pray you feel a welcome of God in this place as well. One, a couple, a couple announcements for the end of the service. One, the bulletin says the choir will be practicing and it actually won't be practicing, which is good news because after the service, we're going to have Christmas goodies to celebrate Owen's baptism. And so if you're listening by radio or on live stream, I would invite you to come here at around 10 o'clock, uh, 11 o'clock, because it'll be really good food. So we're looking forward to just a time of fellowship as we, again, finish a year together as a church and look forward to a new year. And with those words of announcement and welcome, Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of all time, that you are the God who makes all things beautiful in your time. Heavenly Father, we pray that today you would enable us to praise you for all the blessings you have given, that today you would forgive us and free us from all the sins that bind us, that today you would give us new hope for all of the worries which have plagued us, Heavenly Father, that we prepare to journey into a new year, that you would be the one who leads us, that you would be as a star shining your light in our way, guiding us home. Father, may you do that for each one of us today and in this new year, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship. Following the Christmas season, the church has recognized Epiphany, which is the coming of Christ, the revelation of Christ, and one of the things we've typically done is reflected on the wise men following that star, which is an appropriate metaphor as we begin a year asking for God to guide us. And our call to worship speaks of the light that God shines from Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you. And his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Opening song speaks of those kings following that brightness to the Savior. Let's sing together number 358 in our Grace Altar hymnals. As with gladness, men of old will sing stances 1 through 3 and 5, number 358.
that king who lives in the bright city is not only the destination that we journey to, he is the one who journeys with us even today and receive his greeting as he is here. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. Amen. Again, as God has welcomed us into this house, would you turn and greet those around you? And if you're not feeling well, again, you can use the elbow greeting, but let's greet each other warmly in God's house. Our next song, again, turns our hearts to the year that's dawning in this coming week. It is Another Year is Dawning. It's from the Blue Psalter Hymnal. Let's sing these words together. we can enter this new year that's dawning, it's appropriate first to pause this morning and look back at the year that's ending and to confess the sins that we've committed in this year. And our call to confession provides the standard that we will examine our lives against, and that is Jesus' teaching in Mark chapter 12. One of the teachers of the law asked Jesus, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this, hear, O Israel, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So as we examine this past year, we examine our lives. Have we loved God with all of our mind and soul and strength? As we do that, would you pray with me? Eternal God, as we draw to the close of another year and as we seek to claim the year ahead, we realize our need to confess to you that we have not loved you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. Indeed, rather than giving you the love first, we have so often put you in last place, behind love of success and love of money, love of pleasure, love of self. And Father, we confess that rather than loving our neighbor as ourselves, we have often chosen things over people, work over family, the desire to be right over the call to reconcile. Father, for all of these sins and the sins that still cling to our hearts, 
We ask that in this new year you would free us and forgive us and cleanse us. Wash us and renew us, set us free from the chains of our addictions and the prisons of our sin. And by your mercy, may you draw us from a past we cannot change into a future in which we will be changed. Father, in this new year, may you enable us to love you and to love our neighbors as you would have us do. And in these ways, to give you first place. For we pray these things in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Friends, our hymn of assurance and dedication as we enter a new year is that hymn, First Place. Let's sing together. towards a new year, we realize we do not know what this year will bring. Doubtlessly, there'll be communities in the United States that we don't even know the names of that we'll hear in the news, uh, sites of great tragedy. There may be wars in places of the world we've never been to that we'll discover. There may be threats and fears that we can't imagine yet. But we enter this year not knowing what the plan will be, but we enter this year knowing God's promise. And as we do that, we reflect on the promise God makes us in baptism. And this promise goes back to when Christ who came in Bethlehem then rose back into heaven and he said, all authority in heaven and earth, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And then the promise, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. It's in obedience to that promise and claiming that promise that we baptize believers and their children. That promise of Christ actually draws us back in time to other promises that God has made. The Lord God made this great promise to Abraham. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. In later years, even though Abraham's descendants were unfaithful, God renewed that promise through the prophet. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. In the fullness of time, God came in Jesus to provide pardon and peace through the blood of the cross, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. After Jesus had risen from the dead, the apostles proclaimed, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children. For all who are far off, for all whom our Lord and God will call. 
And anticipating the fulfillment of that promise, Paul assures us, if we died with him, we also will live with him. If we endure, we also will reign. As we enter a new year and all that is unknown, we enter with these sure promises. And as we do so, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we feel the uncertainty of our time. And we are so thankful for the certainty of your promise. Heavenly Father, that your lips which spoke this promise to us and will speak anew this promise to Owen are the very lips who thundered over the darkness of creation. Let there be light. And your spirit that is with us today is the very same spirit that brooded over those waters. Heavenly Father, that your hand that will guide us in the new year is the very hand that parted the Red Sea and led Israel through on dry ground. Gracious Savior, you who are present with us are the very one who is present with your disciples on a sea of trouble and quieted the waters with your voice. So once again, even as you have saved your people through the waters, we pray today that by your promise you would be present now. Father, may you seal your promises to Owen and to his family. And in our midst, may you once again show yourself strong. For we trust in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Derek and Amy, I'd like to invite you up. Wasn't that long ago that you stood here and made some promises of your own? And now you're going to make some promises again in the front of church. But today, those promises are in the framework of God making his promise. I'm going to ask you within that bigger promise to answer these four questions. First, Derek and Amy, do you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? What is your answer? Second, do you affirm the promises of God made to you and your Son in his word? Do you affirm the truth of the Christian faith which is proclaimed in the Bible and taught in this church of Christ? Next, do you believe that your son, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And lastly, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help and nurture of the church to instruct Owen by word and example in the truth of God's word and in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ? Derek and Amy, what is your answer? Owen's been around long enough. He knows what's coming. We have no idea what life has in store for your son, but we do know God's promise goes ahead of him and God's promise holds him. And so with that, Owen Wayne Lorenz, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Owen Wayne, child of the covenant and baptism, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Friends, would you pray with us? Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again we have heard through the word of Scripture your word in this place, making a promise to this family. Lord, we thank you with Derek and Amy for the promise that now guides them. We pray for wisdom and strength for them as they parent this firstborn. Father, we do pray for Owen that you will keep him strong, that you will keep him free from every temptation and trial, or that you would be his rock, that you would be his refuge. Heavenly Father, we thank you with the families gathered around them today that you are a God who promises not just to this family, but to each of us to be our God and that we are your people. And so, Father, bless this family. Bless Owen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll just give you a little break. <laughs> Owen, we're going to make a promise to you whether you like it or not. So, <laughs> friends, would you please stand? We're going to make a promise to Owen. We now receive Owen into Christ's church. Do you promise to welcome him in love and to support him now in his growth by word and example? Congregation at Bethel, what is our answer? We do, God helping us. Amen. Congratulations. If you'll be st stay standing, actually. We're going to sing uh, a song as we dedicate ourselves. Parents, teach your children. It's Psalter hymn number 588. Again, tell your children that sing the three stanzas.
be seated. And that him calling parents and all of us to tell our children of this great faithful God is a good segue into our sermon. I invite you to turn with me in the Old Testament today, the book of Genesis chapter 21. Reverend Tinklenberg will lead tonight's service, so this is my final sermon of 2015. And as I reflected on what text to use, I decided to try to draw together two loose ends. This summer, if you remember here, we did a whole series called Forest of Grace, where we began in Genesis and moved to Revelation, looking at stories of trees. And then in the fall, we did a series called Father Abraham, looking specifically at the life of one man, drilling into Scripture one story. Well, today we're going to take those two series and draw them together with a story that I didn't preach in either series, a story of Father Abraham planting a tree. Interesting, joining together these two series as we cap this year together. And as we do that, I want you to ask yourselves this question. What will your life's legacy be as you look back at the turning of the years at what has been and as you look ahead, the question is what will your life's legacy be? As we try to answer that for each of ourselves, let's hear together God's word. Before we do that, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, at the beginning of a new year and the end of another, we realize anew that we need your wisdom. Heavenly Father, that we do not know our own hearts, and so we need your Spirit to reveal to us the truth about ourselves and the truth about you. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would now, through these old words of Scripture, make them alive for us, that you would, through them, challenge us to live for you in this new year with faithfulness and with boldness and courage. Father, do your work in us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we're going to read Genesis chapter 21, beginning at verse 22 through verse 34. A few Bibles, that's page 18. At that time, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of the forces, said to Abraham, God is with you in everything you do. Now swear to me before God that you will not deal falsely with me or my children or my descendants. Show to me and the country where you are living as an alien the same kindness I have shown to you. Abraham said, I swear it. Then Abraham complained to Abimelech about a well of water that Abimelech's servants had seized. But Abimelech said, I don't know who, who has done this. You did not tell me, and I heard about it only today. So Abraham brought sheep and cattle and gave them to Abimelech. And the two men made a treaty. Abraham set apart seven ewe lambs from the flock. And Abimelech asked Abraham, What is the meaning of these seven ewe lambs that you have set apart by themselves? He replied, Accept these seven lambs from my hand as a witness that I dug this well. So that place was called Beersheba, because the two men swore an oath there. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of the Philistines. Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the Eternal God. And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines for a long time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, I'm guessing that most believers, if asked, could tell you that Abraham was the hero of the faith, the great father of the faith. Most of us know that. And many of us, if pressed, would be able to say the reason for that were two great acts of faith in Abraham's life. The first of those at the very beginning of his story when he left his home, his country, his father's household to go to a land he did not know in Genesis chapter 12. And the other great act of faith was at the end of his story in Genesis 22 when he was willing to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Those are the great two towering examples of faith in Abraham's life. And yet in between those acts of faith, there is this little story that most of us don't know, where Abraham, with wrinkled and weathered hands, digs a hole in the dirt and takes a seed from a tree and puts it in the dirt and pats it down. And I want to suggest that that little act was, in fact, a great act of faith. But to understand the faith behind it, we need to understand it in the context of the story we've just read. 
Now in this story, Abraham is relating to a king of Gerar named Abimelech. And at first, this seems like a window into a very routine, ancient, diplomatic event. And so at the beginning of this diplomatic event, very routine, Abimelech is asking for a permanent non-aggression pact with Abraham. That's verses 22 through 24. So he's basically saying, look, me and mine won't attack you if you and yours won't attack us. Let's just kind of make a truce between our families, not just now, but for the rest of our generations. Let's have a non-aggression pact. And after that little piece of diplomacy, then Abraham makes his request. He says, okay, but I've dug a, well, dug a well. Some of your hired people have taken it. Can I have my water back? Well, that's fine. And so they shake on it. They make a treaty. It's very routine. But there are two wrinkles in this story which point us a little bit deeper. The first of those wrinkles is who Abimelech brings with him for this friendly encounter. Notice with me in verse 22, Abimelech came with Phicol, the commander of his forces. Now, Fico, the commander, was, of course, cousin of Fico, the credit score. So you don't want to get in his bad side. But here, what Abimelech is doing is he is bringing the muscle with him. He's going on this friendly encounter asking for peace, but he's bringing his mightiest warrior beside him, a sign of his force. That'd be like Obama going to see one of our allies, Angela Merkel, for example, head of Germany, but bringing with him the head of the Joint Chiefs standing in the back with the nuclear codes ready. This is a threatening gesture. But if we read it, maybe it's not so much a threatening gesture on Abimelech's part as it is a cautious one. And we see that because of the second wrinkle. Notice what he actually asked of Abraham. Now swear to me before God that you will not deal falsely with me. Now why in the world would a pagan king have to ask the hero of faith not to deal falsely with him. Well, he's doing that because he's met Abraham before, and that's exactly what Abraham did. The chapter before, in chapter 20, Abraham goes to the land where Abimelech is king, and notice what happens in the first two verses. Now, Abraham moved on from there into the region of the Negev. For a while he stayed in Gerar, and there Abraham said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister, Then Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent for Sarah and took her. And the result of that was great tragedy for Abimelech and his family and his kingdom. He has been dealt with falsely by Abraham. Abraham was afraid of Abimelech, and so he deceived him. And that wasn't Abraham's first lie. Actually, at the beginning of his story, we remember this because we studied it, when he first came to the promised land and he went to Egypt during a famine, what did he do? As he was about to enter Egypt, Abraham is afraid, and so he says to his wife, Sarah, say you are my sister. He is afraid in both instances, and he deals falsely with others. He lies. And those aren't isolated incidents. In fact, when he explains himself to Abimelech after he's found out, he says this is what he always does. Back to chapter 20, Abraham says, and when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to my wife, this is how you will show your love to me, Everywhere we go, say of me, he is my brother. He has been lying to everyone he's met on his whole journey. And this behavior of lying, which has become a pattern, becomes Abraham's legacy. It is how those around him begin to act. And so Sarah, in chapter 18, is afraid. And what do we see? Sarah was afraid, so she lied. She's been taught to do that by her husband again and again. What do we see in the next generation, long after Abraham and Sarah are dead? Well, their son Isaac, decades later, chapter 26. Now, there was a famine in the land besides the earlier famine of Abraham's time, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar, now an old man, and went to the men of that place, asked him about his wife. Isaac said, she is my sister, because he was afraid. The apple hasn't fallen far from the tree Isaac has learned what you do when you're afraid. You lie. You deceive. You do a little bit of sinful expediency. You twist around the facts to make things better for you in the moment. That's what you do. He learned that from his mother who learned that from his father. And we see here that in Abraham's pattern of lying, he is establishing a legacy of unfaithfulness. And so we stand here at the turning of the year. And appropriately, we look back and we say, what has our legacy been? 
And we look ahead and we say, what will our legacy be? What will our legacy be? What will our spouses or children or neighbors say to summarize what we've learned from our behaviors? And if we're honest, it may not be so good. Fred Craddock tells a story when he was once in a church conference in rural South Carolina. There was a break in the conference and he needed to clear his mind, so he went for a drive in the countryside in the lowlands of, Cal- of South Carolina. And there he came across a, a, a graveside, a, a cemetery. He thought it would just be good to walk around, and so he's walking around the cemetery and he noticed a big headstone for a family plot. And there were all of the graves set out in order for this family. There were small graves for children who had died. There were many graves for adults. But then there was one grave that was perpendicular to the rest. They were all lined up this way, and it was lined up that way. It took up three whole grave sites because of the way it was laid out. And he thought, what a strange thing. And as he was staring at this strange grave site set crossways, or cattywampus, as they say in South Carolina, one of the locals walked by and saw him and said, you're wondering about that grave, aren't you? Craddock said, yeah. Well, the local said, I, I know that guy. He was a, someone I knew in my whole life. We went to church together all of our lives. He died when he was in his 70s. Well, why'd you bury him that way? Well, his family and the church agreed that that was the proper way to bury him because that's the kind of guy he was. He was cross. His whole life, he was always a cross person. Everything was always wrong in the church or in his family. So he was always the person who asked the question, why did they do it that way? That was stupid. They should have done it that way. Why did they put him in charge? Why is she doing that? He was always cross with everyone. And so we buried him crosswise. And Craddock said, that's an awful thing to do. And the man said, the family wanted to do it as a witness. That just because he was dead, he didn't change. He left this world as he lived in it. And that was his legacy in the family plot, lying crosswise. That was his legacy. Of course, some of our legacies aren't so physical, but they're just as real. I read this week of a man named Tom who, when he was around 10 years old, went outside with his father. His father leaned a ladder against the house and told his son to climb it. Tom, at 10 years old, climbed the ladder and stood on the roof, and his father stood below him and said, okay, son, jump. I'm going to catch you. Jump. I got you. With trepidation, Tom jumped. And just as he did, his father dropped his arms and stepped to the side and let his son crash to the ground. And then he stood over his weeping son and he said, don't trust anybody. That's my legacy to you. Be afraid. You are on your own. Don't trust anybody. And that's the legacy that Tom carries of his father. Of course, for some of us, we don't have to do something so dramatic as have our children climb a roof. We can teach that same legacy through much more routine ways. Maybe our children see us screaming and crabbing and slamming things and the phone rings and we pick it up. Hi, how you doing? Oh, doing fine. And we're teaching them the legacy that it's better to appear okay than to be honest. And they're learning. Maybe we're struggling financially and people ask if we need help and we pretend like we're okay and we learn the lesson, the legacy that you are on your own. That be afraid but don't trust anyone. Don't let anyone in. Don't let anyone know that you are weak. We are strong in this family on the outside. That's how we do it and that is the legacy we are leaving to our children. Of course, that's not the legacy we want to leave, is it? And so on a New Year's time, we are, many of us in this coming week, we might make resolutions. We are going to try to do better. We're going to try to be better people. We're going to try to leave a better legacy than we've been leaving. That's what we want to do. But so often, these attempts to leave a better legacy, to be a better person, don't work. We see that in the sort of memes you see on Facebook this time of year. Things like this. My New Year's resolution is to make better bad decisions. Does that resonate with anyone? It never does work, though. How about this one? My New Year's resolution was to lose weight. So far, I've lost my motivation to lose weight. Or this one. My New Year's resolution is to stop lying to myself about making lifestyle changes. Or this one. I can't believe it's been a whole year since I didn't become a better person. These are testimonies to the collective failure we have to make ourselves lead the legacy we want to leave. We can't. And so I want you to hear today, as we look at Abraham's legacy, I want you to hear that Christianity is not about turning over a new leaf. It is about getting new roots. 
It is not about behavior modification, which is what New Year's resolutions do. They don't go deep enough. They're trying to change behavior, but they're leaving the heart the same. That's not Christianity. It's not behavior modification. It's inner transformation. And that's what Abraham needs. Because at the root of his lying is his fear. And at the root of his fear is a lack of trust in God. In chapter 12, before he lied to Pharaoh, God had just promised, I will bless you and I will be your protector. But he was rather focusing on his circumstance than on the promise of God. He was focusing more on his own wit and power than on God's wisdom. He was focused more on himself than on his God. In the same thing in chapter 20, God had just promised, I will give you a son through Sarah. And in chapter 20, he gives his wife to another man because he's more afraid of that man than he is confident in God's promise. At the heart of his lying is fear. At the heart of his fear is a lack of faith. He needs a heart change. And that's what we see God doing through this story. That as the friction of suffering works in Abraham's life, God begins to shape his character. Through the fires of trial, God begins to forge a heart that is faithful. And so even in those times when Abraham couldn't see God's blessings, those around him could. And so when Abimelech and Phicol, the commander, come to Abraham, notice the very first thing they say to this man. God is with you in everything you do. You may not be able to see the promise of God, but we can. You may not be able to trust the wisdom of God, but we can. We see it in your life. God is at work around you. In everything you do, we see God. That is the promise of God beginning to work in Abram's life. And as other people see it in him, Abraham begins to see it himself. And so his faith begins to grow. And so this first encounter with Abimelech, he lied. So much so that he was willing to give up rights to his wife. Now in the second encounter with Abimelech, he is much more bold. He won't even give up the rights to his water. He's saying, look, I've got a well I want back. Before he said, take my woman. Now he says, don't take my well. He has grown in faith. He's beginning to lean not into his own understanding or wisdom or strength, but on the promises of God. And the way that he shows that is at the end of this episode, he digs a hole in the dirt, and he takes a seed, and he plants it. Now, what is that doing? Why is he planting a tamarisk tree in Beersheba? Well, what he's not doing there, this is not an Arbor Day moment. This is not a little bit of carbon footprint time. We're going to try to preserve the environment. That's not what's going on. It's not an aesthetic trying to beautify his campsite. He is doing something deep here. And to understand that, you need to read the beginning of the chapter. In verse 5a, Abraham was 100 years old when this happened. Now, when you're 100 years old and you're digging a hole in the ground and you're planting an acorn, you are never expecting to climb the boughs of that tree. You are never expecting to eat the fruit from its limbs. You are never expecting to rest under its shade. You are not planting the tree for yourself. Who is he planting for? The second half of verse 5. His son Isaac was born. Abraham is planting this tree, not for himself. He's planting it for the next generation. This is a picture of a tamarisk tree. They grow 50 to 60 foot tall. Abraham is planting that tree under whose shade he will never rest, but the future generations that come from him will rest under it. And so he is living here in a sign of faith. He is giving to those who follow him a sense that they, like him, can be bold, that they do not need to be afraid. He is rooting his testimony in the ground, not turning over a new leaf, but giving new roots of faithfulness to his family. You could say that in his pattern of lying, he was giving a legacy of faithlessness, but in planting a tree, he is giving a legacy of faithfulness. R.C. Sproul says this, The planting of this small tree in the Negev probably served as a landmark of God's grace. That's what he was doing. And as we read the story, we see that's exactly what this was. So he plants this tamarisk in Beersheba. Now what do we see about Beersheba? Well, years later, when he takes his now infant son, has grown up, 
And he takes him to sacrifice him, and God provides. And Isaac and Abraham learn that God provides. Where does he take Isaac afterwards? The last verse of chapter 22. They set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. That's where he raised Isaac. Under the boughs of that tree, where Isaac could play under the shade of that testament to God's grace. Next generation, after Abraham and Sarah are long gone, what do we see? Chapter 26. From there, Isaac went up to Beersheba, to where this tree is. And that night, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. God is with you in everything you do, says Abimelech. Now God, the next generation, under this tree in Beersheba, says to to Isaac, do not be afraid. I am with you too. Move to the next generation. What do we see? Uh, Genesis 46. So Israel, that's Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, set out with all that he had, his wife, and when he reached Beersheba, where this tree is growing, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac, and God spoke to Israel in a vision. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid. God went to the root of the lying, the fear, And in this testament of grace, God is now saying to every generation that comes, do not be afraid. I am with you even as I was with your grandfather who planted that tree. That's the act of faith. And so as we stand here at the turning of the year and we look to another year and we say, what will our legacy be? Another way to ask that question is, what trees would God have you plant in faith under whose shade you will never rest? What are the ways you can share your time and your talent and your treasure where you may never reap the harvest, but that future generations will? And so we baptize Owen, and we sing the song, Tell Your Children. And for those of us who are parents, that means one of the legacies we leave is when we're on the phone after an argument or when we're struggling to give a legacy to our children that it's okay to trust others and to be vulnerable because that is part of the way we trust God and the way he provides through his body. That's the legacy we leave. That some of us may, as we do our planning for our wills, may leave money to a a foundation to build buildings and Christian school additions and additions to churches and things in colleges, buildings we will never use, trees under whose shade we will never rest. But future generations will. And our act of trust is a legacy that God gives through us. So what will your legacy be this year? In big and small ways, how will God, through faith, plant trees that future generations will enjoy? Through your life and through mine. And as we think about that, I want to end with this. Ultimately, this story is not about the faithfulness of Abraham's legacy. It's about the faithfulness of his God who is our God too. In verse 33, after planting the tree, notice what Abraham says. Abraham planted a tree, and there he called upon the name of the Lord, the eternal God. The NRSV says the everlasting God. That's the first time we see that name for God. He's planting a tree for the future, and he names the God he worships, the God of all time, the God of past and present and future, the everlasting one. And who have we just celebrated at Christmas? Isaiah 9 verse 2. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and he will be called the everlasting, the eternal Father. In the fullness of time when Jesus came and he taught about himself in John 8, what did he say? Before Abraham was, I am. I am the eternal one, the El Olam, the everlasting God. And in Hebrews 13, what do we find out about Jesus? He is the same yesterday and today and forever. Friends, we plant a tree in faith for the future because the God at work through us is this eternal God, ever faithful. That's his legacy. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we look back at this year. Whether we are married, or parents, or single, widow or widower, each of us see the ways that we have not given you first place. And as a result, as we have not trusted you, our behaviors have reflected a lack of faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though we fail you, your spirit is at work in us. Through the 
fires of suffering forging in us your character, the character of Jesus Christ. Through the friction of troubles, shaping that character to reflect more who Jesus the faithful one is. Father, we pray that in this coming year you would help us in our speech and in our actions to live by faith, to look to the future and to live in such a way that future generations could rest under the shade of the trees we plant by faith. Father, may you shape our legacies to call other generations to you. For we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. Our song of response is a song as we enter a new year to walk by faith. The song is by faith. Let's stand as the music begins. we walk by faith is by living lives of prayer. Today, two items to pray about. I announced on Sunday that Aaron Wasink has been diagnosed with prostate cancer. We want to pray for Aaron, especially as we look for the facility where God will open up for him to continue to live and receive care. We also want to pray today for Alma Vinmanen, who yesterday was taken by plane emergency to Sioux Falls. Um, They believe she had a stroke. She has some other medical things going on right now. So we want to pray with Alma in this very difficult time for God to guard her life and to preserve her. So as we pray for those things, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we walk by faith and not by sight, we thank you for the glimmers of your faithfulness that we have seen in the lives of those who've gone before. Fathers, for those of us who have had the blessing of grandparents, parents, friends and uncles and aunts, who have lived your faithfulness through them. 
where we have seen in their lives, in their sacrifices for new generations, in the way that they have supported things like Christian education, in the churches where we worship, in the way that they have, through their lives and through their words, reflected faithfulness and godly character. Lord, we thank you that in these lives we have catch a glimpse of who you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you in this Christmas season that we see that faithfulness most clearly in the sending of your Son, Jesus. The child who was given, born to us, eternal Father, the one who before Abraham was, was the great I Am, the one who is the same yesterday and today and forever. Lord, we thank you it's because of Christ's faithfulness, proven as you raised him from the dead and now has have seated him at your right hand, Lord, that through his faithfulness we can live lives this new year that also are faithful. Through his spirit at work in us, living through us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of your spirit in this world. We thank you for the promises that you have made to Owen this morning, that we can be witnesses and participants in that promise. Heavenly Father, we thank you with Stephen Vorse and Bethany Wilson and their families as we anticipate a wedding the promises that they will speak, but also the joining together that you will do of man and woman into one flesh. Father, for those of us who are married, we thank you for the gift of marriage. We pray that in this new year, you would shape our marriages to reflect to new generations mirrors of your faithfulness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the staff of this church, and we thank you especially for elders and deacons and care and concern group coordinators who will be finishing their duties on this Sunday, and for those who will pick up their duties next Sunday, Lord, we thank you for these faithful servants who work so hard among us. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for missionaries who also bring this gospel of the kingdom around the world. We're thankful again with Eric Fetters and his team as they serve in Liberia. We're thankful with Josh and Joni for their presence with us on a home service. We're thankful for the updates we've received from Dan and Gina and Kuiper and Kelly and April Kroll as they work in Mexico, Texas, and also in Spain, Lord, we thank you for their work. Heavenly Father, even as we thank you for the work around the world, we do thank you for this community, for each church, each council, each volunteer, each pastor. This morning, we especially pray your blessing on Covenant Christian Reformed Church and Pastor Corey. May you strengthen this body of Christ as they enter a new year. May you show your faithfulness in them and through them. Heavenly Father, we do pray that your spirit who has worked in your church would also work in this world. We pray that you would restrain violence in this new year. Heavenly Father, that you would bring peace to places torn by war, especially in Syria and Iraq. We do pray for the leadership in Iran. Pray that you continue to give peace in Israel and Palestine. Heavenly Father, we do also pray that you would, in this coming year, guide this nation. As we enter an election cycle, we pray that you would guide each vote that is cast, each person that runs, that the man or woman of your choosing would be chosen as president, that you would bless the courts and the Congress, the governors, or that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we do pray also in this community and in this church for those who need you. We thank you with Stan Hawk for a good report as he um, continues to, to deal with issues in his digestive system. We pray that you'd bring full healing to him, guide future steps. Lord, we pray with Martha Goslinga as she has transitioned this week to Franken Manor. We pray that you would help her to experience that even in a new place, she is home in you. Lord, give her strength, lift her up. Heavenly Father, we pray this week for Joe Rose as she goes in for surgery on her knee. Pray for continued healing for Haley Visser and Mary Hubers and Deb Fakus and Henry and Joanne Bio and others who are recovering from surgeries in the past weeks and months. Gracious God, we continue to lift up Trina and Neil Moss. Harold Bohr, especially as Trina and Harold grow weaker, may you bless their families as they gather around them. Be a good shepherd in these days. Encourage them, bless their times, bless their conversations. Lord, we thank you that they are now and always will be in your hands. Heavenly Father, we pray now especially for Aaron Wasink, for Jean Vonk. We pray for Michaela DeCock and others who are receiving treatments for cancer or are dealing with cancer. We pray especially for Michaela as she goes in Tomorrow, for a first round of, of treatment for her cancer, Lord, may you strengthen her, walk with her. Heavenly Father, we also pray today for Alma Van Manen. We don't know exactly what's going on in her body, and we know that she is in your hand. And so, Lord, bless the doctors as they do many tests today. Quiet her heart. Give her a flooding of your peace. Father, we do pray that if it's your will, you would guard her life, guard her health, and restore her to us. 
Heavenly Father, even as we pray these things, we do lift up the aged and the young among us every season of life. May you hold us in whatever need we have. Shepherd those of us with mental illness and those of us walking with family members who struggle with depression and anxiety. Heavenly Father, be with those of us dealing with chronic pain and chronic disease as we enter a new year. We do pray for healing for first fruits of your kingdom. Pray too for your blessing and comfort for those who grieve in these days. Father, you know our need. Hear our hearts. Hear our cries. Receive these prayers and receive also our gifts and offerings, for we offer them in faith in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. We bring our gifts and our offerings now, which is one of the ways that some of us will plant trees under whose shade we will never rest. The first for the ministries of this church and denomination, the second for Christian education. after his death, that tree was how his voice through God's grace 
called out to the new generations and proclaimed God's faithfulness. Our closing song invites us to do the same. The song is, We Will Extol You, God and King. The chorus is that one generation will call to the next. Our God is good and His love is strong. Let's stand to sing as the music begins. We'll sing stanzas one and two. We'll receive God's blessing and then we'll sing stanza three. We invite you afterwards again to congratulate Derek and Amy and their families and also to enjoy some Christmas goodies as we fellowship as the family of God in this place. Stand to sing as the music begins. as we finish one year and enter a new year in this coming week, receive and go in this blessing. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. May he encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Amen.